from the dark recesses of my unconscious mind into the glaring light of objective reality. You are listening to the Dark Mind Podcast. Friends and familiars, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dark Mind Podcast, where we explore the boundless realm of dark literature and film. On today's show, we have a Bram Stoker award-winning author of dark fiction that spans multiple genres. In addition to his masterful storytelling, he's also an actor, screenwriter, book cover designer, and editor. He's joining me today to discuss his recent work of supernatural horror entitled Guests. So without further ado, join me as we delve into the dark insight of Keelan Patrick Burke. Keelan, welcome to the show. Hi, Vince. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me on this third day of August 2023. I read your work guests and not only enjoyed the contained narrative, but also the way you draped the narrative with an existential crisis that all the characters were suffering in various stages of their lives. So I'm looking forward to hearing your insight on the crafting of this story. Oh, that was a strange one. Well, as far as the finished product, a uh, small synopsis would be that it's about a young man named Mark and his group of friends that work in a hotel in a somewhat rural area. And one night, Mark and his friends get called in to work for a group of people scheduled to come in by bus right before a snowstorm, which is going to result in all of them having to stay the night at the hotel due to being snowed in. However, once they come face to face with the group that they've been scheduled to serve, things get a little weird. So what is it about hotels that give them this strange energy that can be exploited for horror? That's a great question. You know, my belief in supernatural or ghosts is uh, pretty much limited to the idea that people leave energy behind. Mm -hmm. And wherever you have large groups of people, wherever you have high traffic areas or buildings that have seen a lot of lives, a lot of death, I think it's kind of inevitable that there's a signature left behind, you know, for all the fear and all the emotion and all the joy and everything that happens in all those rooms in a hotel over 10, 20, 30, 100 years, that it's some part of it lingers. And I think, you know, when we think of the classics like The Shining and things like that, they just have this ominous quality to them, whether they're completely empty or full of people. There's so much possibility for exploration there in fiction. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think in hotels that it's impossible for a single building to see that much life pass through it without leaving something of itself behind. Yeah. When it comes to houses, usually that's confined to particular people for long periods of time but yeah the possibilities are endless with a hotel and people go to hotels for various reasons not just necessarily to vacation sometimes they're hiding from something <laughs> yeah and not necessarily benevolent reasons yeah and yeah it's just so many identities so many emotions so many cataclysms so many celebrations there's just such a history I think that marks a place like that. So it obviously is really appealing for a writer to just choose an angle and come at it and say, well, here is this old building that's dying. 
what's in there. And if there's nothing in there by itself, how will it affect the people who visit? Mm -hmm. Well, Mark has dealt with the recent passing of a family member, which brought him to a bit of a crossroads in his life as to what direction to head next. And I think you're around my age. So I was wondering if, like me, that's something you often think about and if it informed the subject matter of the novel, like mortality and the direction of your life. Yeah, I don't want to say it's an obsession, but at least when it comes to writing, I am fascinated, I guess, for want of a better word, about grief, mm -hmm. particularly. And over the past couple of years, I've lost a lot of family members. My dad passed away in January. The year before that, my aunt passed away unexpectedly. Mm. What interests me about it is, I mean, it's very easy to say, well, life is short. But I mean, it is. Yeah. But it's an overused adage and it's an, an inescapable truth. But I'm more interested in the psychology of grief. For example, you can have great, deep relationships with two family members, one of them dies, you're broken up about it probably for the rest of your life. The other one dies, you have a bad patch of about three months and suddenly it feels better. Why is grief different? You know, why would I mourn someone I barely knew for so long and not be able to get over another person's passing from the same family? And it could be different family dynamics. It could be the duration of the relationship, but it doesn't make any logical sense. It never hits the same way, and it never hits anyone the same way when they lose someone. I don't think grief is comparable other than on a base psychological level. I don't think any of us process it the same way. And the individuality of such a universal horror fascinates me. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of my work is informed by the idea of loss, by the idea of getting old by the idea of the inevitable because as horror writers the biggest monster and the one you never defeat mm -hmm. is death itself so yeah i write about it a lot yeah it's odd that you say that it doesn't follow simple metrics like how long you knew the person how close you were to them do you find that those you know classic stages of grief that they put out there i can't remember which order it's like anger bargaining uh, acceptance is the last one. Yeah, I don't know. What's your experience so. with those? No, I don't think so. I think that they can happen that way. But, and I think they're too amorphous either. I mean, you know, you'd have to be, I guess it's a contradiction, you'd have to be so self-aware of what you're going through mm -hmm. to recognize those stages. But the very act of going through them kind of shields you against that self-awareness. It's like falling into a tar pit and somebody asking you your exact coordinates, you know, <laughs> it, it's not kind of uh, not something you think about when you're in it. You're supposed to sink about four inches every hour. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So where would I be now? Where am I on this scale? Am I four inches in? Am I eight? It's yeah, oh, yeah. It, it's not really, I don't think there's any room for a clinical diagnosis when you're grieving. Yeah. You know, it's easy to go to someone and say, well, you're obviously going through this when the obviousness of it is kind of irrelevant. You know, it's just this fucking hurts. That's it. That's all. I don't need labels for it. I don't need to know which which stable my horse is in. All I know is this sucks. Yeah. Well, your graphic description of the physical details of some of the elderly folks was horrific. And I mean, like, I've read Splatterpunk, like uh, Judith Sonnet and uh, Christopher Triana and, yeah. um, you know, Aaron Beauregard, and they get graphic with gore. But just your your description of how the aging process had affected these people were just almost as visceral as, you know, like a Splatterpunk novel. So... What were you using as a point of reference to describe those visceral details? Honestly, I don't know if I was conscious of any template for that or any inspiration. But what I do recall coming to mind is the fact that I left Ireland in 2001, and I've been living here since. For the first couple of years, I didn't go back very often. But every time I did, 
everyone had aged, a natural part of the process. But if I had been away for six years and came back, it was noticeably dramatic, the advance in age in people, especially the older members of the family. And it never didn't shock me. It's like death, you know, it's inevitable, it's normal. Mm. But it would shock me every single time to see because, you know, I don't feel like I've aged when obviously I have. I don't have the benefit of a time lapse. Mm. So, yeah, it kind of saddened me. And in the meantime, I lost all of my grandparents in the space of a couple of years. Some of it was graceful. Some of it wasn't. And it got me thinking of the ugliness of death, the ugliness of aging. And it's not, you know, obviously this sounds terrible. We say, oh, you're getting old, which is a horrible process. I don't think that at all. Yeah. I don't mind the idea of getting old, but it does come with a fear and inelegance to it where you have no control over what your body does. It's like everything. It's going to age. It's going to let you down. It's going to experience failures. And I think it's that more than death itself that scares me is the idea. And a lot of my family members have gotten Alzheimer's. Mm. So it's the idea of being trapped inside a body that you can't keep from just rolling down this hill. Yeah. And all the things that you're asked to be okay with and people's perception of you, which is covered in the, the book as well. One of the characters, while they're all happily being kind of ageist, points out, well, we should all be lucky enough to have endured as much as these people and still be around to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You think that they didn't have hopes and dreams and wishes and broken hearts. You know, it's easy to think of older people as well, their usefulness is at an end. And it's a horribly, horribly ageist way to look at that when every old person was us once and we'll be there eventually. You know, and it's just, I don't know, it depressed me, so. <laughs> Have you made it to that uh, that stage yet where you're like, these kids today are just soft? <laughs> Do you know what? I have. I have. I, so, I, so far, it's horrible. I don't, I don't <laughs> understand the music that's popular. I, do, I, I swear to God, I'm out in my yard shaking my fist at clouds at least three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought that would happen to me. I remember, you know, playing rock music and my mom walking in and going, Jesus, turn it down. Uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm never going to be uncool and older. It's just not <laughs> as for me. And now, holy shit, I don't get anything. <laughs> I'm so out of touch with everything. I feel like a, an absolute moron. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> well, 40 is the new 20, though. That's what I hear. It is. I remind myself that every time I have to Google the latest internet lingo so I seem cooler than I am. <laughs> what the hell is TTYL? God, yeah, I don't know. I don't even try to pull that stuff off. I can't pull it off. <laughs> oh, I like to just pepper it in there real casual like so it looks <laughs> like I always talk that way when I absolutely don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, circling back to the book... Mark observes that the group wear these very distinctive necklaces that look like leafless trees within a gold circle. And anybody that listens to the show regularly, I am notorious for reading way too much into the details of stories. Uh, every once in a while, I'm right, though. So that's probably the reason why I just keep beating the dead horse. I was curious to know if you had the Kabbalah and the tree of life on your mind when you develop the details for the reason they wore that necklace? I'll tell you, that's a fantastic insight. And I desperately want to seem smarter than I am <laughs> and say that, yes, you're absolutely correct. Well spotted. But honestly, <laughs> one of the points in, in this was that I went out of my way to make sure it wasn't explained because I didn't feel, and I hate this in horror movies, when a character shows up to explain everything and then dies. <laughs> I kind of went out of my way to adhere to the more realistic idea that if this happened to you, it's unlikely that anyone is going to take the time out to explain to you exactly what it is, what the religion is, how it all started. And I just wanted it to be obscure and vague and therefore more terrifying. And the symbolism itself 
does vaguely refer to a, a circle of life, but not any particular one. And it's certainly not any particular religion. I wanted it to be just obscure enough that, honestly, so that you could do what you did and make assumptions of your own. And mm. you're not wrong. That wasn't my intent, but imprint anything you want on it adds layers to it. Mm. Well, let me, let me make one more attempt and then I'll move on. Okay. The home of the group of elderly folks was a nursing home or I guess like a uh, maybe a retirement community called Morning Star Retirement Community. Yeah. Now, Lucifer is referred to the Morning Star in the Bible. Did that even subconsciously cross your mind <laughs> when you came up with that? Um, cannot confirm or deny that one. I remember very, very early on that I was going to kind of attempt a Rosemary's Baby type thing where somebody in the hotel was pregnant and that's why these guests showed up to usher in the second coming, but I ultimately decided it was overdone and too hokey and I couldn't come up with that <laughs> original enough angle on it. Uh -huh. And at that time, the retirement community was called Morningstar. So I can't remember the genesis of that but it doesn't seem impossible that that's what informed it. Okay. Remember, the original idea was 10 years old, so. Yeah. All but right. you could be right about that. And if you're not, let's just say you are anyway. <laughs> All right. I think if I remember correctly, that's the only two times where I'm like delving in and reading into things. So. But I love that, though. I, I love when people do that. I love when people do that to my advantage. Oh, okay. Not so much when they say, oh, you meant this awful thing when you said that. And I'm like, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're a horrible person. <laughs> hey, why do you hate old people? I'm like, what? <laughs> gotcha. Well, so you have the main characters that are in the prime of their lives, the young men and women, the rank and file wait staff, and they're mainly concerned with having a good time. You have the elderly folks that come in on the bus that are in the last years of their life. And then you have two middle-aged men, Jessup and Buddy, that seem to be both stuck in dead-end jobs. And Jessup in particular seemed to have basically given up on life, at least when he finds out a certain event is going to happen. So what were those two characters' roles in the story arc? I think that Jessup being based on my arch nemesis for my first job, mm -hmm. he was meant to be more of a character and more of a villain than he ultimately ended up being. So he was a caricature of the establishment? <laughs> we, oh, yeah. He was going to be just a corporate wank, you know? But he, <laughs> uh, he actually became a lot more interesting to me as I was writing it. So for me, he represents stasis, you know, a life kind of hampered from the beginning by the implication of, you know, bullying and ultimately became one himself without his knowledge. And that all he has left is the hotel. Like he is the hotel and without it, there's no point going on. He can't at this point in his life restart mm -hmm. or doesn't know how. So when the hotel is threatened, he's threatened. And rather than resisting it like everyone else does, he concedes to it. He says, well, let me embrace the idea of being someone else because it's what I've always wanted anyway. And Buddy is kind of the closest we get to the representative of change. He represents the change that's coming to the hotel on a surface level, on an insidious level, and embraces it the same way that Jessup does but only because to him it's normal. When we get done with these bodies, we, well, I don't want to spoil too much, but yeah, we uh, trade them in. And he has no qualms about it. What's strange about him is that he doesn't, to me, seem evil. He's not the bad guy. Mm. I mean, when you're reading it, he obviously represents that, but I don't believe that he believes it. I think this is just a pattern of things. This is the inevitability of life. But yeah, that's what they represent. I think that Buddy is inevitable change. 
and Jessup is conceding to it. He's allowing that change instead of resisting it. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I wasn't really putting into perspective. I don't want to give away any spoilers either, but let's just say he had already made a change long ago. Yeah. And his responsibility was to help others do the same. Yep. Okay. He's the ushering in of inevitable change. Yeah. And Jessup is the force that buckles under it because. He has no other way out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the way things are, as we all know. Yeah, because at a certain point in the story, even though he knows what's going on, he's just like, to hell with it. This is the best it gets. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, you can fight your whole life, but when you see nothing change and you're stuck, then any change is better than none. Yeah. Oof. Well, speaking of the inevitability of the aging process and change. The hotel was large, lavish, and an odd thing to have in such a rural area. And that resulted in it having financial problems. So it seemed like even the hotel was having an existential crisis. Yeah. Was that the reason for the hotel's backstory? And how did the elderly folks choose it as a target, so to speak? Did that have something to do with it? Um, I think in much the same way as we'll say something like Dr. Sleep, where the bad guys are drawn to certain energies. Mm -hmm. It's a very Kingian type thing to do with the Marston house and Salem's lot, just drawing bad things, putting out bad energy like a beacon. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much think that's all it was. But the hotel itself represents change because not only is it crumbling and having a change in fortune, but the owners are constantly dithering about the idea of maybe leveling it, making it a golf course. Mm -hmm. And it's arbitrary. You know, to them, it's just a building. If it's not making money, it, it ceases to have any value. Yeah. And I think because it's in its dying days, these people from Morningstar were drawn to it like a lighthouse. Mm. Well, amidst the terror of the plot, there is a very involved love story in the narrative that may or may not have a happy ending. The story is written from a lighter point of view involving the want to preserve the friendship of two people as opposed to something like a lustful love triangle. Is that meant to give the story balance? And if not, why is the love story not as racy as the plot is terrifying? Hmm. I mean, the simplest answer for that is that, well, one, I don't really write racy love. You know, I find love as a concept in books to be marginally less interesting than grief and death and horror. I guess that's why I'm drawn to the genre in the first place. I find love to be a crucial element because it is part of us. It's part of life. But I don't know. I think the core conflict at play there, the love triangle, kind of, I think, speaks to the very ending, which is hard to talk about, but with certain decisions certain characters make and basically tells you what happens after the end. Mm. The want, the need at any cost will inform what happens after the words, the end, appear. Because some people have said to me, you know, well, I'd like to know what happens next. So, well, if you pay attention, I already do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like I've written love stories. I find love to be fascinating and just as inexplicable and chaotic as death and mortality and grief and everything else. Mm. But for this one, I think I just needed Mark to have felt like he'd lost everything. And therefore, given one chance to obtain the thing he wants the most, he takes it. I think on some level, even though it's not in the text, that he knew. And I say it's frustrating, I can't talk about it, but it, you know, <laughs> that he knew on some level what he's pretending he didn't by the end of it. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't prefer one way or the other, whether it's yeah. some racy, steamy, sex filled storyline or whether it's more about the emotion and the connection involved in it. It just, I find it interesting what makes people write one way or the other. Like, does it have something to do with, well, this guy's a hopeless romantic, this guy, 
maybe he's a bit of a Lord Byron, <laughs> some sort of a rapscallion, and that's just the way he writes? Or Oh, yeah. No, I don't find sex scenes terribly interesting to write about. I always feel when I encounter them in books that they're just there for a very Hollywood idea, the 80s particularly, of just write, here is the blank spot where we have two characters who barely know each other, just roll around in bed to saxophone music. <laughs> I don't find it terribly interesting or titillating to read about it unless the act itself is pivotal to the plot. Like it, it was building to it. It happens for a reason that changes things. Mm. Then I'll just say they, you know, they made love that night or something <laughs> really cringy and move on. <laughs> because I don't, I mean, when I read some of the people's sex scenes, I just, Jesus, I cringe because it's like, you know, his probing member friggin did cartwheels and i'm like oh god what <laughs> and people are otherwise fantastic writers let themselves down by being absolutely cringy when they write about <laughs> women's bodies in particular and i'm just sitting there pretzels on the couch squinting at it going why <laughs> you just wrote three pages about an antique lamp that is some of the most beautiful writing i've ever seen and then janice is bouncing boobly down the stairs what the <laughs> Uh, well said, sir. Well said. <laughs> yeah, it's true, though. You know, yeah, Harry, yeah. otherwise fearless international spy, was undone by Karen's moist oyster. <laughs> it's just, oh, stop. <laughs> uh, well, I don't totally cringe to that stuff, but maybe that says something about me as a person. <laughs> a lot of people don't, and I no judgment here. I just, you know, just to address it in my own way, I... <laughs> can't justify it most of the time and if I can't then it doesn't belong there I'd only be shoehorning it in just to titillate people and honestly I'm not hugely confident in my ability to not write it as cringily <laughs> as I just <laughs> described I would try yeah, but you know as soon as somebody's putting baby oil on their feet, it's time to just move on. <laughs> and you're also coming at it from the perspective of a writer. I can't quite empathize if I'm reading like this graphic sex scene where they're using terms like, what did you say, uh, gooey oyster or something like that? Moist oyster. <laughs> Moist oyster, yeah. Yeah, like I guess I don't have the empathy because I'm not a writer to know what it's like to like sit down and, and write something like that out. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I do recall there was one very brief sex scene in the Timmy Quinn series of books, but that had been a boy and girl had known each other since they were kids, and the series follows them all the way through adulthood, and then they don't see each other for years, and when they meet, the spark and the dynamic and the old love returns, and that made sense to me for mm -hmm. them to end up together, but not, again, not in a graphic way. I think it's like two lines, but you get all you need. Mm -hmm. There's nobody juggling muffins, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's there is enough, and if I put you know, any more, you have come up with such great terms these last few minutes. Are you sure you don't want to incorporate a moist oyster or? <laughs> I think all those terms justify why I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sex scenes aside, guests is a great book. Don't they? Listeners at home, you should definitely check it out. Link is in the description. But uh, I wanted to address kind of your previous works. You have been a Bram Stoker Award nominee five times and won in 2005 for your novella, The Turtle Boy. Yeah. So I was curious to know of all your work, what do you think it was about The Turtle Boy that people connected with the most? Nostalgia. I think it came pre Stranger Things, pre our mm. renewed obsession with the 80s and retro stuff. And I had just moved here and I was living in a farmhouse in Delaware, Ohio, which is where the Turtle Boy is set. And out the back was just fields and fields. It's all houses now, but at the time it's just woodland, open fields. And my stepson at the time and his best friend used to just get up every morning, go out an adventure mm. and I'd be sitting in my writing office looking out the window at them it's weird it doesn't matter where you're from but we all remember if I see two American kids out riding bikes right now I remember instantly 
my neighborhood in Ireland and doing the same thing. So we're kind of united in that. Mm. And I don't know, it just felt like a, a summary throwback story that would have been fun to write. And the pond, all the things described in it were real. And I said, well, what if they went back to that pond and there was a dead kid sitting there? Mm. And once I had that, the rest was easy. But I think, yeah, I think people responded to it because before we got exhausted from by nostalgia and it became so commercial and pop culture people liked the idea of that old throwback rural American story of coming of age thing of just kids in the summer. Yeah. I wonder, I don't know what the age demographic of a series like stranger things is, but I wonder if that was responsible for getting any kids of that age to, you know, <laughs> drop the, uh, the PlayStation for a second and go outside. I would like to think so, uh -huh. but I don't have that kind of faith in humanity anymore. <laughs> Every time I see a kid on a skateboard or a bike or bouncing a ball down the street, I think I've time traveled. Uh -huh. It's amazing. I celebrated too, a ridiculous degree. I thought, oh, that's love. That's great. There's hope yet. But it's rare. Yeah. You know, I remember leaving my house at eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday walking to the very edge of town, 30 miles away with friends, mm -hmm. seeing how far we could get. There was the forbidden frontier, the border of town. You couldn't cross it because it was all unknown woods and monsters beyond that. Yeah. And then you came home and the sun went down and the streetlights were coming on. You had to duck under your mom's arm to avoid having her slap you across the back of the head because you were late. <laughs> and it was brilliant. And we had a haunted house down the street that was guarded by an old man with a friggin' hatchet. <laughs> who became a phantom to us. We never saw him. Uh -huh. So clearly he was supernatural. But he was guarding the house and we used to creep in there anyway and get up to all sorts of hijinks. But it was literally, it was like Stephen King wrote it. Uh -huh. So yeah, it was kind of inevitable, I think, that I turned out the way I did and did what I did. But yeah, I think all of that, I think that's the connective tissue. I think that we all have those stories. You know, we all have our nostalgia and I think the turtle boy just came along at the right time to tap into that before we drove it into the ground <laughs> yeah it was funny because I grew up pretty much in the throes of the satanic panic I don't know if you had anything oh yeah I remember that yep yeah so all of our monsters were all like these satanic cults like there was this church that was supposedly a satanic church and then there was these old abandoned bomb shelters where supposedly a satanic cult met and sacrificed babies and shit like that so. see and i love that not the actual sacrificing of babies but the idea that <laughs> you're not into that <laughs> no not lately but it's it's just this whole <laughs> idea of you know the reputation that all these places had because everywhere was haunted when i was a kid mm -hmm. but yeah we didn't have the satanic panic over there but we were well aware of it happening over here what we had were the video nasties where if there was graphic gore i think it was westinghouse or something or whatever but she was a british politician she banned all sorts of evil dead cannibal holocaust all of these were labeled video nasties it was a huge thing video stores could get fined for carrying them oh wow and in typical fashion, bootlegs popped up, and we all saw it anyway. Yeah. Did you ever see Cannibal Holocaust? Yeah. Oh, I just saw it recently. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> I don't love it, but I can appreciate some of the elements in it, the style of it. I, I love the whole found footagey thing, but mm -hmm. Jesus, the animal stuff really bothered me. Well, yeah, yeah, and the stuff involving the um, actors that were children... Just, yeah. Yeah. Just overall pretty unpleasant. It was Ruggiero, wasn't it? Yeah, Deodato Ruggiero. And uh, yeah. I mean, it was well made, but it was unethically made. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, its impact is undeniable, but at the same time, it's like something you see just to have it as part of your exploration mm -hmm. of the classics and stuff. But I don't know. It left a bad taste in my mouth. I'm not a huge fan. But I'm not a huge fan of those types of films anyway. You know, if the whole point is just to butcher people, I kind of lose interest really quick. Yeah. Well, you wrote the screenplay for a very powerful short film called The Cold. Yeah. And 
the story is about a man and a woman that are isolated in a remote area attempting to survive basically the cold, the, the weather <laughs> event. Yeah. So I watched the film and in the film description, it refers to the forms that the characters see as shadow people. And I think I'm about to put my foot in my mouth because I promised I wouldn't be reading anything into anything for the rest of the podcast, but I guess I'm going to. Were these actual entities because it seemed like the shadow people were manifestations of their conscious desire to give in to death, being at war with their instinct for self-preservation? That's actually a terrific read on it. Yeah. And in this case, I can agree. Yeah, you're not wrong on that. It was that and it was also the revenants of other people who had died. It was mm. taking the form of this come to death manifestations because there's little hope in fighting seems to be a recurring theme in my work but yeah yeah no i would say that that's accurate so was that a result of like a natural weather event or was there some nuclear <laughs> dystopian thing that happened honestly didn't give that any thought whatsoever okay just an apocalyptic event that could have any number of reasons for it. I think in my head at the time, it was a very pessimistic view of the inevitable results of climate change, which, you know, fucking seeing now, but yeah, just an escalation of the day after tomorrow. We're boned basically. And here you go. Yeah. Well, further expanding on dystopia, my fiance and I watched Slime City Massacre. God. I guess about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I loved the fun of the splatter and the old school dystopia. Though I forget what the still annoyed I got robbed of an Oscar nomination for that, by the way. Ah, but you did get Best Actor at the Polygrind Underground Film Festival, did you not? I did, I think. Yep. Yeah. Could you uh, tell me a little bit about the movie and also the film festival? Because I looked that up and uh, that looks like a very interesting event. I can't tell you anything about that. All I know is that I won something and I think I have a certificate somewhere that says that, but I've never been to it. <laughs> I don't really know anything about it. So gotcha. well, that's the first part of your question. Um, that was honestly one of the highlights of my life. I was basically approached by Greg Lamerson, the director, who's also a, an accomplished writer and novelist. And we knew each other going way back on from message boards and everything else. And uh, he wrote to me one day, I had mentioned something on a post about that I did uh, theater acting in, in school. Mm -hmm. And I loved certain plays and I loved being in them. I'd done some Shakespeare, all this good stuff, which I did. I really, truly loved that. But I hadn't done anything since. And, uh, he wrote and said, well, I'm doing a sequel to Slime City. I was wondering if you'd have any interest in being in it. And when he asked, I thought as a friggin' extra or something, you know, mm -hmm. or a coffee runner, something. <laughs> but he actually sent me the script and said, I have you in mind for this character, which was one of the leads. So I was filled with absolute terror at the thought of doing it. Mm -hmm. And also knew that I'd probably regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't say yes. So I said yes, and I went, and we filmed in Buffalo for, I think, three months. Mm -hmm. And it was just absolute madness, hilarity, fun. Yeah. I rarely had so much fun. It, it was just I loved everybody involved, from the crew to the other cast. Everybody was just alive with excitement at the prospect of doing this film. And it was nuts. Absolutely. Absolute, I've never been so covered in friggin' slime and gore. But yeah. It was a blast. Easily one of the best times I've ever had. It's just, it was so new to me. I'd never been in front of a film camera before. You know, I hadn't in 10 years or so had to learn lines. Uh -huh. It was bonkers. I loved it. Yeah, I told my fiance that. It was like, you know what? I bet making a movie can be a tedious, oh, yeah. boring pain in the ass. But I was like, I bet you this movie was fun as fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can be so destroying. Like, I mean, you know, you hear these stories all the time of these great films and all the absolute disaster that went into making them happen. Mm -hmm. But from the start to the end of this, it was just, it was so much fun. I mean, I was just delighted to wake up every day and go to set and see what kind of insane shit I was going to be put through, <laughs> you know? Sat so many times, like, in 90 degree heat, 
getting latex put on my face and sweating and then have to keep reapplying it and mm. super gluing it onto me. And then I went across the street to the bar at one point after I was done for the day and they couldn't take the makeup off me. So I just went and had a few beers with it on. Nice. And all the locals were just staring at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was, there was two things you drank. You drank some sort of alcohol and then ate some sort, well, I guess you didn't really drink it. It was like some sort of yogurt or something? Himalayan yogurt. Himalayan yogurt. And what was the alcohol was some sort of? Zachary Devens elixir. Elixir. That's what it was. What was that that you were ingesting? Just water and vegan yogurt. Vegan yogurt with like food coloring in it, I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't vegan, but one of the other cast members was, so we all took one for the team, even though it was fucking vile. <laughs> it was hard to eat that stuff. It seriously tasted like wallpaper paste with milk in it. <laughs> so if it was vegan, no dairy, what's the dairy substitute? Was it like rice or? Oh, I don't know that. I didn't ask. I just added. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know why I'm being that specific. Like, oh, what was the ingredients? God damn it. I need to know this. There's an outtake on the DVD of a blooper of me gagging on it while I'm just uh, shoving shit. it down my throat. It was, uh, it's bad, but it was fun. You know, it's like, I think what made it so much fun is that every single person involved in that, the day we showed up on set and knew what we were getting ourselves into, we just absolutely threw ourselves mm-hmm. into it hundred percent. Well, what year was that made? I can't remember. Oh, damn I think it just celebrated its 10-year anniversary or something. I don't do so well with dates and times. Yeah, neither do I. Accurate memories or any of that stuff. Massacre. 2010. Okay. So it was made in 2010. And I mean, that had 80s all over it. (laughs) Yeah. Like, how did, I mean, did it have something to do with... Did he shoot on film rather than digital? And the clothes you were wearing, even the guy who was kind of like your co-star that I thought was Rowdy Roddy Piper for a second when I first saw him. (laughs) All of that straight out of the 80s. How did you guys do that? I don't know. I think it was actually just coincidence because if I remember correctly, at least I know for myself that we provided our own costumes. The thing was, there was such a low budget that Anything that could be done to cut the cost of it, we helped. And one of those things was, and it wasn't a command. It was, if you can, this is what your character looks like. So I went to the Army surplus store and bought a lot of stuff. Got a friend give me his dog tags. Uh, we showed up looking like that. So I don't know what informed it other than the script itself. And I think if there's a cause for all of that work in the way it did and for that particular look, he did film it on digital, but... I think uh, editing and post-processing probably contributed a lot to it as well, because I know that he had a look for it in mind. So I think we all just followed instructions and dressed the way we were told to, and the rest was in his hands. Great movie. The link is in the description for that, listeners at home. You definitely need to check that one out. You uh, adapted your work Sour Candy as a graphic novel for John Carpenter's Night Terror series. Yeah. And I was curious to know, what are the creative logistics that a project like that involves? Like, how do you (laughs) take that from... Yeah, it's basically like writing a film. A comic book script has a similar format and feel where you're just basically writing stage directions. You're describing the art panel by panel, as specifically as you can, although I prefer not to get so deep into specifics that it kind of robs the artist of their own interpretation, their own freedom. But yeah, that's basically it. I think it was 110, maybe 100 page scripts. And uh, once it's handed in, the artist goes to work. That's it, really. Mm. And then you get the colors and the letters involved and John Carpenter and Sandy King's people have a great team. They just all work so fluidly together that it was such a blast working on it. Have you ever met John Carpenter? I dealt with his wife so many times. I can't tell you the amount of times I just want to say, hey, could you have him hop on Zoom real quick? I have a question. (laughs) And then talk to him for 17 hours. Yeah. Yeah, just like real nonchalantly, like it's no big deal. And then when you get him on, oh, my God, you were my idol. You know, nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally fanboy out and just 
kill all credibility. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it's such an amazing experience though because I mean he is my favorite horror film director. I loved almost every movie he's done. Mm. So yeah, just having a book out there, a graphic novel out there with his name on the top was such a thrill. I admit I fanboyed out and squeed a little bit when it <laughs> arrived in the mail. I do the same thing. Yeah. Well, so you alluded to it earlier. You were born and raised in Ireland and emigrated to the U.S. What brought you to the U.S. and where and how does it fall within the chronology of your writing career? Um, the how is a peculiar story. <laughs> I graduated in journalism in Ireland and there were no jobs in journalism. So I ended up bartending at three different bars. And on a quiet night, an American tourist came in. We sat, we talked all night. She left, went back to America the next day. On my birthday, a couple of weeks later, she sent me a plane ticket to come visit. Oh. I came and still here. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And at the time, it was, okay, here's me looking at the want ads for journalism jobs. And she proposed, take a year. You're always going on about your writing. I've read your short stories. Take a year. Write. If it comes to nothing, then go back into the workforce, and that's it. Wow. So I had the year. In that year, I published a bunch of short stories and wrote The Turtle Boy. Mm. So it kind of took off, and it never stopped. So yeah, I owe a lot to her for giving me that opportunity, because it was the one thing I hadn't been allowed. I hadn't been able to find to that point in my life. It was always, you know... The hotel and guests was the first job. I think I just turned 17. Mm. And it was just one job after the other, always going with this bleak awareness that I have to do this to stay alive, but it's really not what I want to be doing. I want to be writing. I've been writing stories since I was eight years of age. And my first publication in Ireland on my 18th birthday. And But it really only took off when I got here mm. and was given that time to just sit and write. And it was like the floodgates opened. I wrote so many stories. I think of it often that I think I wrote something in the realm of 50 stories in that year. And now I'm lucky to write one a year. Wow. Well, listeners at home, learn a lesson from Keelan. When you're given an opportunity, do not fuck it off. <laughs> yeah. Just work your ass off. My God. And I was lucky, yeah. I understand it's not a, a common situation, but I don't know where I where I would have ended up if not for that, you know? I mean, I don't think I'd ever have stopped writing, but I don't think we'd be having this phone call. <laughs> That's amazing. Unless it's me trying to sell you carpets. <laughs> Do you know you could be paying too much for your home phone service? <laughs> Good evening, sir or madam. <laughs> <laughs> well... Tell me about your publishing evolution from independently publishing yourself to having a literary agent and a mainstream publisher. I come at everything absolutely backwards. <laughs> I remember when I first started writing novels, I sent them out to agents and an agent provisionally signed me, which was basically, I like your book. I'll represent you if I can sell this book. If I can't, no harm, no foul, you know, mm. go away from me. So she couldn't sell it, and that novel was Kin. And it was weird because all the editors who wrote back to us from all the big publishing houses said pretty much the same thing. We love it. Great. Can't place it. No room for it. And I didn't understand what that meant, but it was encouraging that they liked it. Assuming, of course, that wasn't just a gentle way to let me down. Mm. Can't place it. Like within a genre? Yeah, yeah. I think within their division, I think is what it meant, was that there's no room for something like this at the moment. Mm. What else do you have? And what I had at the time was nothing. Mm. So plenty of near misses, or as George Carlin said, near hits <laughs> over the years. Rest in peace, George. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Legend. But what happened with them was Sour Candy was optioned for film by Blumhouse and they sent me the paperwork and I panicked. I was like, I don't know how to do this. 
so I rose to the agent I wanted the most, the one that had her name. It kept cropping up over the years. And I was like, someday. So I wrote to her and I said, look, I have no new novel to sell you. I have basically nothing but a film option here on the table that I need to negotiate. I'm working on a novel. It's not done yet, but I can send you some of it. And I sent her some writing. She read it, called me, basically interviewed me for an hour and then signed me. Mm. So since then, there has been a lot of deals that I can't actually talk about. But honestly, I started off full of passion, wanting to get an agent, wanting to get New York book deal. And then for about 10 years, just wrote independently and just kind of didn't care as long as people got to read the work. And it's funny because the benefits of doing that mirror and sometimes eclipse the benefits I think I would have seen from traditional publishing. Mm -hmm opportunities one after the other just started opening up based on just the work I was doing here by myself. And we've come full circle now because she has my latest novel and we're discussing strategies and doing all sorts of stuff. Nice. But yeah, so I think the evolution was circular, really. I went from that young, wet behind the ears passion that you're only legitimate if you're published in New York to an ambivalence about it all mm. for about a decade and plenty of success in the meantime, to finally coming back around to, well, if we can make the New York thing happen, let's try it. Mm. But I certainly don't depend on it. It's not, it used to be such a dream that it would explode my mind every time I went to sleep thinking about walking into bookstores and seeing my books there. And the gloss has gone off that now. There's been such a change in publishing that, honestly, I think a good book will find a home, a welcome home, and readers, if marketed correctly, and just, I don't know, handled with care and if the story's good enough. Mm. Well, getting into your writing process, how much of the plot progression of a book is already in your head before you even start writing the book? And how do you proceed with what you have? That varies from project to project. There are times, as mentioned with guests, I had the first three chapters, I think, of that written 10 years ago and then left it. It wasn't going the way it was supposed to. So I abandoned it and then came back to it and read those three chapters again, changed them and barreled onwards and finished it in the space of about two weeks. But sometimes I'll have the beginning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll have the end. Sometimes I'll have the middle. Sometimes I'll have all three. It depends. Sometimes it's a single image. Sometimes it's a single word pronounced a certain way. Mm -hmm. It can be anything that triggers the inspiration to write it. The rest then is basically looking down at a jigsaw puzzle scattered all over the table from the job that puts together into some kind of a cohesive picture. But it's never the same. It may have been guests that you were talking about because I cannot remember when this podcast you were on aired, but I was listening to you on the Activated Authors podcast and you were talking about a particular book that you had basically completed but couldn't pull the trigger on publishing because it was missing something and you couldn't quite put your finger on what that was. Was that guests? No, that's uh, Mr. Stitch. And yeah, that's done. Okay. But that's that for four years complete. You know, it was just, it was done. It was a big book uh -huh. and I couldn't send it out and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a hole in it and one that was going to, destroy it if I didn't figure out what it was. And eventually I did. And how did you harness your creative intuition? Did it just come to you or did you? I think the longer you do this, the more you develop an instinct for the flaws in your own work. Some of it is glaringly apparent. You know, you look at something and go, well, that's ridiculous. And other times you'll feel almost a physical sensation of running into a brick wall. You can see that something's not right and you're shoving it in the direction it's not supposed to go. In the case of Mr. Stitch, it's probably the most dramatic because what ended up happening to solve the problem was to cut one of the main characters entirely from the book. And that was about probably 20,000 words out of it, about 100 pages, which devastated me to do it. I thought, oh, my God, I'm making a terrible mistake. And it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that character was gone, the story flowed in a way it hadn't before. And it all tied together. What do you find to be the most beneficial aspect of writing for you personally? Catharsis. Catharsis. Therapy. 
I'm of the old, ridiculously outdated Irish mindset that we're impervious to therapy. The <laughs> irony being that everyone on the planet we probably need it the most. Mm. But no, I, I think it's self-care, self-therapy. It's analysis of exterior forces you can't control. It's analyzing the things that hurt the most. Just, just like painters, you know, you leave, you leave your senses and you become something and someone else when you're writing. You're lost in this world you're creating. It's escapism as much for the writer as it is for the reader. And it just, it's a safe place. The irony being, of course, that it usually isn't for the characters mm. or for the reader. But for the writer, writing is sometimes the only safe place. Well, you are not only a writer, but also an editor, book cover designer, and as we've spoken of, an actor, award-winning actor. What is the common denominator you need to be good at all of those different things? I don't know, because I'm only good at about half of them. <laughs> well, I've seen your cover designs. You saw Flying City Massacre, <laughs> right? Lawrence Olivier was not even remotely stirring in his grave. But no, I mean... I think if there's a common denominator... <laughs> Sorry, it, it, it was slow. It, it crept in, finally. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think the common denominator is commitment. You know, I think that it's not enough just to want to write, to act, to design covers. You have to want to be good at it, the best you can be at it, and you'll never be good enough. I think that I'll be right until the day I die and will never be as good as I want to be. And that's just something you accept. Mm. But the commitment to try is what differentiates professionals from hobbyists. And that's not uh, a slight against hobbyists. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm. For me personally, to be the best I can be at anything I put my hands to, I taught myself how to cook a couple of years back and I'm obsessed with it now. Mm and angry at myself that so much of my life passed me by where I couldn't. Yeah. And I will make food for myself with restaurant style presentation and nobody here. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm not going to slop something on a plate after laboring over the stove. I want it to look good. I want it to be visually pleasing to me. I want the same from book covers. Mm. I want my books to entertain. I don't write just for myself. So, my own satisfaction isn't enough. I have to go the extra mile so that people are thinking about the books at random times and years after they've read it, they'll think about it. It'll pop into their head and go, huh. It's like in, with Sarah Candy, I get a lot of people write to me and say, well, I was in Walmart the other day and holy shit, kid was screaming in the candy aisle and he freaked out. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> You're literally altering people's perception of the most banal things. Uh -huh. And they're remembering your book fondly. They're remembering that scene. And it's hard work. I mean, writing is the hardest job I've ever had in my life, but it's the one I love the most. Mm -hmm. And just sitting there and telling a story isn't enough. Telling a great story is the endeavor. So to answer the question, I just think that you have to commit to it. You know, you have to put your absolute 100% heart, body, and soul into it, to any pursuit. Awesome. Well, Keelan, it has been a pleasure talking with you. You too. And thank you for great questions. I have done very rarely, but I have done the occasional podcast where the person had no idea who I am. <laughs> that sounded very egotistic. I don't mean that they should, <laughs> but if you're going to invite me on your thing, you should probably know at least what I do. Yeah. And the amount of times I get, so you write books, <laughs> tell me about them. And I'm like, oh God. Do you like stuff? Do you like saying <laughs> stuff and saying? It's just blatantly, oh, I've heard people in the book community mention your name, so come on our podcast. Yeah. But then they've got nothing to ask me, and it's awkward. There's so much silence. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. I feel like I'm in a library. <laughs> like, hello? Anyone here? Uh, but yeah, so I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the really well-crafted questions. These are always fun to do because I don't even feel the time passing, you know? Yeah. Well, once again, I appreciate you coming on the show. And as we bring the show to a close, is there anything you'd like to plug or let your readers or viewers know about? Uh, no, I think that if by now people are still listening and I haven't bored them stupid, then <laughs> they'll probably 
find their way on their own to my book. And uh, yeah, I don't do plugs very well. All right. I'm like a really bad electrician. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? They won't have to do much work because listeners at home, all links are in the description. Yay. And Keelan, thank you again for joining me. Anytime. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe to the email newsletter by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday, where I will be joined by a legendary underground filmmaker. So until then, stay healthy, stay sane, and as always, thank you for listening. See you next time. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Hate is what I hate, let them hate, never mind them. Be more ambitious, trying to reach the next plateau. And I can't stop till I achieve my goals. Keep a couple fees inside the photos. So official with the vibe, you can fuck up my zone. Hold on for a minute, let me count mine. You know, hey, you know. Hey, uh, they throw a salt on my name. Ooh, they let it throw shade. Cause a young nigga pay, family straight. Diamonds in my chain, I'm just doing my thing. Nuts just dragging, nothing here average. A far above that shit, simple and plain. Ballin' when it's sunny, but I keep some cheddar stack for the rain. Yeah, I keep some cheddar stack for the rain. Say it with some fees and they all on my team. Rollin' my lap, pourin' my drink. Team me too, everybody has to step. They came a long way from that bootleg cape. Nigga be losing, there ain't no way. My homie just died and they cried for days. Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my mama. Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my mama. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Hey, this one I ain't let them, ain't never mind them. Be more ambitious, trying to reach the next plateau. And I can't stop till I achieve my goals. Keep a couple fees inside the photos. So official with the vibe, you can fuck up my zone. Hold on for a minute, let me count mine. You know, you know. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Hey, this one I ain't let them, ain't never mind them. Be more ambitious, trying to reach the next plateau. And I can't stop till I achieve my goals. Keep a couple fees inside the photos. So official with the vibe, you can fuck up my zone. Hey. Hold on for a minute, let me count mine You know, hey, you know. count my money while I'm counting these blessings Mind the setbacks, those were just lessons Moving too fast, had to set a pace Bleed my goal, shit ain't no race Tennessee he's straight, I'm only chasing money Smart nigga, mama ain't raised, no dummy Stay in time free, but if you bring it, we can run it As a young and I learned bullshit about nothing Nigga be losing, there ain't no way My homie just died in the cry for a day Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my mama Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my hey, mama Nigga be losing, there ain't no way My homie just died in the cry for days Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my mama Tomorrow ain't promise, I put that on my mama yeah. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Hey, this one I ain't let them, ain't never mind them. Be more ambitious, trying to reach the next plateau. And I can't stop till I achieve my goals. Keep a couple fees inside the photos. So official with the vibe, we can fuck up my zone. Hold on for a minute, let me count mine. You know, you know. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Hey, this one I ain't let them, ain't never mind them. Be more ambitious, trying to reach the next plateau. And I can't stop till I achieve my goals. Keep a couple fees inside the photos. So official with the vibe, we can fuck up my zone. Hold on for a minute, let me count mine You know, you know